I want to invite you, if you will, to open in your New Testament to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. We'll spend most of our time in the Gospel of Luke this morning. We'll start there in chapter 9. We'll uh, go to chapter 14 before we are done. And so if you maybe want to put a marker over there, that'd be a good place to do that. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus, it's obvious that he wasn't necessarily impressed by the things that people are often impressed with today. Not the things that people were impressed with back then either. But today, people are very often impressed with things like mere numbers. That wasn't true of Jesus. There were times when he was followed by great, great crowds, large crowds of people, and we'll see that that's the case in Luke chapter 14. That wasn't really what Jesus was after, at least not merely for the sake of the numbers himself, themselves. What Jesus wanted from people is he wanted commitment. He wanted discipleship. Last Sunday evening, we talked a little bit in the brief lesson about discipleship, that to be a disciple is to be a follower. It's not just to learn from, but also to be dedicated to the one who is our teacher. And so to be a disciple of Christ <clears throat> is more than just a, a well-balanced, you know, a one facet of a well-balanced life. You know, something that just takes its place among the other areas of life. You know, you got this area, you know, the work environment, and you got uh, family, and then you got spirituality. It's not just one aspect of life. It is to be the controlling factor of our lives. It is to learn from and to follow Jesus in all that we do. And it's important for us to understand that although the call of discipleship is something that is open to anyone, the terms of discipleship are applicable to everyone. Jesus would say here in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 that if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And, and when Jesus said that, he said, if anyone, when he said if anyone would come after me, what he implied is that anyone can. And the call of discipleship is open to everybody. In fact, Jesus was criticized by the authorities of his day because he was willing to spend time with people like tax collectors and other types of sinners, and they just didn't understand that. At the beginning of chapter 15, it talks about the fact that tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. He, they didn't understand that. And Jesus would kind of set things straight by telling them the, you know, the parable of the prodigal son, that, that God wants people to come home, and that's what his desire is. And so we go through the Gospels, and we read about Jesus talking with people like the, the woman at the well in Sychar, who was a Samaritan woman, who had made an absolute mess of her life. And that call of discipleship is open for anyone who desires it. And yet this same verse in Luke chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 23, that tells us that the call of discipleship is for everyone, also tells us that the terms of discipleship are for everyone as well. And so he says again, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And, and what we see in the Gospels all through is that the Lord doesn't lower his, his standards of discipleship for anyone. The terms are the same for everybody. If we want to be disciples of Jesus, then we can expect to be given a cross to carry. And I think we need to stress the fact that the call of discipleship is ultimately a call to a cross. Because people need to understand the kind of commitment that the Lord requires of them if they are going to be one of his disciples. And so when you look at it, the leaders of the Jews thought that the call of discipleship was too broad. You're talking to all the wrong people, they thought. But the crowds who followed Jesus for a period of time, the great crowds that would follow him here and there and watch his miracles and listen to his teaching, they ultimately decided that the cost of discipleship is just too high. They weren't willing to make that kind of investment. And they followed Jesus, and, and they, they watched with amazement at the things that he did and even at the things that he said. But when he began to talk about the cost of discipleship, what was involved in that, they ultimately walked away. In the passage I want us to talk about this morning, we're going to find, again, that there were large crowds that were surrounding Jesus. They were following along. And I wouldn't be surprised if at least some of these people who were following Jesus at least kind of had the idea maybe that this is the promised Messiah. And if that's true, 
then they would have also been thinking about the the great expectations that went along with that and with the kingdom of God. They were thinking in terms of the status, perhaps, and the the glory that was typically associated with the coming of the kingdom in the minds of most of the Jews at that point in time. They weren't necessarily thinking about things like discipleship and service. So it was true. Jesus was about to be enthroned as king. And yet I'm confident that the people who were following him had no idea that the route to the throne would go through Golgotha. The cross is just around the corner at this point. It's not very far away. And Jesus didn't want there to be any misconceptions about what it meant to be one of his followers. He wanted to be sure that these people understood the cost that was involved in being a disciple. And the truth is it's important for us to understand the same thing as well. And so I want to begin reading in Luke 14. We're going to start in verse 25, where it says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it began to mock and saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And so there are three things I want us to, to see in this text this morning, three things from these verses that I think are important for us to understand, to grasp about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And the first thing that I want us to see along these lines is that Jesus tells us that he must come before personal relationships. That's the point there in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I mean, how's that for a starter to, you know, to thin the ranks, so to speak? But I'm going to ask you a question. What was Jesus trying to say there? Obviously, that's a, uh, that, that kind of captures our attention. But we have to understand what he says there in the light of everything else the Bible tells us about family relationships, don't we? And so when we do that, of course, we recognize that Jesus is not trying to say here that we need to hate our families in the typical sense of that word. He's not saying that we need to feel an intense or a passionate dislike for our families or that we ought to have feelings of hostility or animosity toward them. That's not the point that Jesus is trying to make, is it? He was trying to tell us that he must come before any other relationship, that our relationship with him takes a priority. He was not talking about animosity. He's talking about priority. As Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He was saying, put me first in terms of priority in the relationships of your life. And I think this point is something that, that we need to recognize, of course, because people sometimes have a, have a hard time adjusting to how their decision to follow Jesus is going to affect all of the other relationships in their life. I mean, how is it going to affect my relationship with my family? How is it going to affect my relationship with my friends and the other people that I come into contact with? And it's important for us to understand and to come to terms with these things, really, if possible, even, you know, even before deciding to follow Jesus. I mean, this is one of those issues that every Christian faces at some point in time. You know, what am I going to do when my commitment to Christ is tested by some other relationship? I'll tell you, it's better to settle that question sooner rather than later. And so there have been people who have been cut off from their families. And there have been people who have been cut off from their friends. And, And that because they chose to follow Jesus. And that's why we need to be sure that that people know up front that Christ comes first, that Jesus comes before personal relationships. But there's a second thing that Jesus points out in our text this morning, and that is that 
he also comes before personal desires as well. And I think that's at least alluded to at the end of the, the verse we read just a moment ago. If anyone comes after me, he would say in verse 26, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think it's what Jesus meant back in the passage or in the next verse in, in verse 27 when he said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Same point being made there, I think. You know, it seems obvious to me that the, the concept of the cross is one that has been watered down in our society. And, and I suspect that we have lost the sense of just how brutal the cross was. I, I can assure you that the people in the first century who listened to Jesus and, and uh, lived at that point in time, that they, they didn't think of the cross as jewelry or they didn't think of it as a decoration of some kind. That's not, that's not how they thought about a cross. The cross was an instrument of execution period. It was the chosen instrument of the Romans for capital punishment. It, it was a fate that was reserved for the enemies of Rome and for the basest of criminals. And so the Romans throughout the years, they used a variety of forms of capital punishment. They strangled people at times and they burned people in oil and they threw people to wild animals. They did all kinds of things to put people to death. And at some point, they borrowed crucifixion from the Phoenicians. And it's been suggested that they did this, at least in part, because all of these other forms of punishment would kill the victim too quickly. And so what they wanted was they wanted a slow and a painful, a public and a terrifying way to execute people in order to make a point. Don't mess with Rome. And the Jews were familiar with the cross. They had seen people crucified before. And they knew what Jesus meant when he talked about a cross. When they saw someone carrying a cross, they knew that that person wasn't long for this world. One thing they likely had not seen very often was someone who took up a cross and who did that willingly. You didn't carry a cross unless you were forced to do that. But what Jesus said is that those who would be his disciples, they would choose to carry a cross. It is a deliberate choice that has to be made. It is an act of our own free will that we're talking about here. But what did Jesus mean when he said that his disciples needed to bear their own crosses? We know he didn't necessarily mean that literally, that in every case that would be you know, how that would work out. But what did he mean? I'm pretty sure that what people often think of as crosses that they have to bear really are not. And I'm not even sure that some of the genuine difficulties that people face fall into the category of crosses to bear. Things like a, you know, a sick family member or a disability of some kind, you know, whatever it might be. And, and, and those things are difficult, and I don't want to minimize any of that. And people who don't lose heart in the face of those, those problems, in the face of those struggles, they're certainly to be admired. But I don't think Jesus had things like that in mind. That's not what he's talking about. There are people who make no claim to being a disciple of Jesus who deal with those types of problems. They do it every day. And so I think that the cross that Jesus was talking about, what it consists of, are the personal sacrifices that we make or called upon to make simply because we are his disciples. Amen. Or to put it another way, what Jesus was saying is don't follow me unless you're prepared to die to self and to the desires of self. Ultimately, that's what he's saying. You see, if we choose to follow Jesus, every decision we make has to be made in light of his will rather than our own. It's not a 50-50 proposition. It's not 75-25. It is all Jesus or not at all, is, as the case is. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul would put it this way. He would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And we might look at that and say, yep, that, that's exactly right. That describes the life of the Apostle Paul. I'm not sure what that has to do with me. Here's what it has to do with you and what it has to do with me. In that same, in that same letter, a few chapters later, chapter 5 and verse 24, Paul would say these words. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. No ifs, ands, buts. This is how it is. And if you want to know what that looks like in practical terms, I'll just tell you, 
Uh, you just look at what Paul goes on to talk about in some of his letters. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, for example, Paul would say there, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That's just a small sampling. Don't get me wrong. It's not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. But you get the idea. We're not living for our will. It's not do what you want and and everything's going to turn out fine. To take up your cross is to live a life of self-sacrifice. It is to do the will of Jesus. It is is to, to put aside your own desires. It is to put to death your desires and to live for His. It is complete surrender on a daily basis. Isn't that what Jesus meant? In Luke 9 and verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's not a periodic, sometimes I work up the courage kind of thing. It becomes who we are. And so there's no way to to be a disciple of Jesus otherwise. As Jesus said in, in our text in Luke 14 and verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus must come before our personal desires. And then the final thing I want you to see in our, in our passage in Luke 14 is that Jesus must come before personal possessions. That's the point I think he's making there at the end in verse 33, end of the chapter. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Uh, Does that get your attention a little bit? I mean, that's one of those that captures our attention. Just as we saw earlier, I think we have to understand what Jesus meant here by taking it in the context of, you know, everything we read about this subject in Scripture, the subject of possessions. And when we do that, it seems pretty clear to me that the Lord's not saying we're not allowed to have any, you know, you can't have anything at all. There were wealthy people, even in the early church, they were by no means the majority, But they didn't have to give up everything they owned. That's not what we see when we look through the New Testament. But i tell you what, they did have some special responsibilities, didn't they? People who had, had special responsibilities. And so we read passages like 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 that would say, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Let them deal with these things in the right way with, from the right perspective uh, with right priorities and don't put so much emphasis on that that we don't think about eternity. I'm so glad that after 2,000 years that's no longer a challenge, aren't you? It's a consistent thing, isn't it? People in every age have to come to terms with this. And by the standards of the world in which we live, there are not many of us who don't fit into verse 17 just like firmly as for the rich in this present age. If you want to look at who that is in this world, just probably grab a mirror. would be the best way to do that. And what I think Jesus was saying, or at least implying, that those who desire to be one of his disciples, they must come to realize and to accept that ultimately what they have, everything they have, it really belongs to God. Servants don't have possessions. Everything belongs to the master. And, and so we may sleep in a house and we may drive cars, we may eat food, we may make, you know, make use of all kinds of luxuries that God has, ha, has given to us, but everything we use from day to day really belongs to to the master, and we need to remember that. I think that's one of the most difficult things for potential disciples of Christ to deal with in a society like ours. And if we're being honest about it, it's one of the most difficult things for those of us who are disciples to deal with. We we don't like talking about that kind of stuff very much. It makes us uncomfortable. Sometimes we look at various passages and and we may even try to explain away things that that are said uh, that that have to do with wealth and possessions. And and so we'll say, well, that's, that's what Jesus said. But what he meant is, you know, this. And if we are not careful about that, the result is that we may at times rationalize things like greed, 
and materialism and, and do that to our own harm. I believe we need to understand that when we are done rationalizing, there is a principle that we just can't get around. Jesus stated it in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, and he put it this way, you cannot serve God in money. He didn't tell you it's going to be difficult to do it. He didn't say, you know what, if you try really hard, I mean, you might just get that all balanced out. He said, you can't do it, period. It's impossible. When we begin to treat our possessions as ours and ours alone, what eventually happens is that they begin to possess us rather than the other way around. Ever seen that happen? Rather than serving our needs, they become our master. And it seems to me that the man that we typically refer to as the, as the rich young ruler that we read about in Matthew chapter 19, he's a good example of a person who is possessed by his possessions. And so he came to Jesus, and he wanted to know what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. He was evidently a moral person. But I want you to notice what the Lord said to him about these things. Matthew 19, verse 21, beginning. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away, sorrowful, it says, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples then, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Sometimes people want to say, you know, what's involved in a camel going through the eye of a needle? What's, what's all that about? Well, let me tell you, I'm going to clear it all up for you. It means it's hard. It's all I got. It's all we really have to know about that. Some churches would love to have a guy like the one we've just been describing. He's not going to embarrass us with immoral behavior. Uh, you know, he, he's got a lot of money. He's prestigious. I mean, he's a ruler. We could really go places, you know, if we had people like that, as if, you know, the draw of the Son of God himself is not enough. I mean, right? But I want you to remember that Jesus wasn't interested. He wasn't interested in attracting people without complete commitment. The truth is, he didn't want anybody's money. In fact, Jesus saw that wealth was actually a hindrance to this man. And he wasn't telling this rich man to give away all of his money simply, you know, so that it would help the poor. That had been a great, a significant consequence of doing so. Jesus was telling this man to get rid of his money because it would help him. It was keeping him from putting the Lord first. That was the issue. And when the rich ruler, young ruler left, Jesus didn't run down the road after him saying, wait, 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 maybe we can work out a compromise. He laid down the terms of discipleship. And it was up to this man whether to accept them or to reject them. Ultimately, he rejected them. The man in the parable of the rich fool had the same problem. Luke chapter 12, if you'd like to turn over there. Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading in verse 16. Where it says, And Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. He said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? And then Jesus ends it and says, <coughs> excuse me, verse 21. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And when you look at the context of that parable, Jesus had just issued a warning to the people who were listening to him. It's found in verse 15. And here was the warning. Take care, he says, and be on your guard. When Jesus says take care and be on your guard, I'll tell you what you probably ought to do. Take care, be on your guard. Against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
And, and what the parable of the rich fool is, is it's pretty much a case study in materialism. In essence, here's what Jesus says about this. Here is what happens when someone believes that his life does consist in the abundance of his possessions. Here's what it looks like. It's not terribly pretty. And Jesus wasn't saying, again, you can't own anything. He wasn't saying that you, you can't let anything own you. The only thing that we hold on to tightly as disciples of Christ is Jesus. He must come before personal possessions. Now, as we bring things to a close this morning, let me, let me point out what I believe is the point of this lesson. Everything we've talked about, here's what it is. Jesus will not be Savior if he can't be Lord. Will not. A lot of people today want everything to do with the Savior. But they're not terribly interested in having a Lord. They, they want Jesus to be there for them when they die, but they want him to kind of just keep his distance a little bit while they're living. Let me do my thing. But if there's anything we've seen in the verses where we've been looking at this morning, is that you can't have salvation without submission. And Jesus will not be Savior if he can't be Lord. And so I want to ask you a question. Will you submit to the Lordship of Jesus? Will you truly be a disciple of his? When Jesus gave what we call the Great Commission, as we talked about last week, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's not any left for anybody else. And on that, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So if you haven't become a disciple of Jesus, why not today? He's Lord of all. There's no getting around that. You can't just say, I, I choose not to recognize it. He's Lord whether we make him such or not. So why not if you haven't done it? Why not be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Have that, that fellowship and that relationship that comes from doing so. And then continue to learn his will. Each and every day as you take up your cross and you follow him. Are you willing to do that? Because that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. If you're here this morning and we can help you in some way, however that is, we want to encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing.